On the second day of the sixth International Water Conference 2021, hosted by Action in Bangladesh, I am Anhara Rabbani working with Action Aid, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all at the third thematic session of the conference. The title of our session is uh, Rights of Rivers, and for this session, we have with us uh, Barrister Mansoor Hassan OBE, Chairperson, uh, Executive Board of Action Aid International Bangladesh Society. He is also the Executive Director of Center for Peace and Justice of Brack University. We have Dr. Rohan D. Souza, who is the Associate Professor in Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies of Kyoto University, Japan. We have Dr. Munzurul Kipriya, who is the member of Action Aid Bangladesh General Assembly and also Professor in Zoology Department of University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. We uh, have Adil, Mr. Adil Kayum Mullah, and he is the research scholar in University of Kashmir, India. And finally, we have Dr. Aynil Nisha, Professor Emeritus, Center for Climate Change and Environmental Research, Brack University, Bangladesh. Pleasure to have you all. So the session will be moderated by uh, Barrister Mansur Hassan, um, sir. And I, before I hand it out to him, there are a few housekeeping rules for the session. Please turn on your microphone when you're speaking and turn it off uh, when you're finished talking. Please turn on your video when you're speaking. And for the remaining time, feel free to keep the video on or off as you prefer. Uh, and the participants who are present with us at the moment, uh, please share your questions, queries at the chat box and the relevant panel member will answer you during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Barrister Monsur Hassan uh, Sar to um, take over the session. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, welcome to all of you and uh, thank you to Anhar Rabbani for is making a start of this session. Uh, as you all know, this is the sixth international water conference being held in a, virtually. Uh, it's, the title is, the title of this session is Water, Climate and Justice in the Wake of COVID-19 pan Pandemic. It's the second day and, um, and I'm really delighted to be moderating this session, which is called the Rights of Rivers. And we have an impressive lineup today. Um, I mean, by way of opening remarks, I basically would like to sort of welcome you all on behalf of the behalf of Action Aid Bangladesh. And um, and and this is something that Action Aid. This issue has been is has been something that Action Aid has been it's been involved with for quite some time, and uh, and and it 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 is such an important issue that even globally nowadays people are saying, experts are saying that it will be, you know, the, the issue of water, issue of kind of water flowing through rivers, which is going to be the key, one of the key factors in terms of geopolitics, in terms of uh, forthcoming uh, in international relations uh, uh, exchanges. And even some people say that, you know, the major conflicts that will emerge in the future will be related to the, to the flow of rivers. I mean, as a lawyer, I'm quite familiar with the concept of rights of individuals, rights of individuals as embodied in basic documents such as constitutions or bill of rights or the UN charter. But uh, the fact that we are now talking about rights of rivers, I think is, is, is an indication that, how, uh, that uh, the, the way we have exploited rivers all over the world and misuse the, the, the flow of water uh, along the rivers. And, and now we have reached a point uh, when livelihood of people living around along the banks and, 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 uh, uh, and, and in the adjacent areas, the livelihood of people are, uh, is being seriously affected. It is affected to the extent, I think, from what I know, it is in, to the extent that people are actually being displaced. Uh, and, and sometimes we call, we call these people uh, climate refugees. We can call, you know, and, and uh, internally displaced uh, individuals. Um, so it's really uh, a very serious issue that we will be discussing this evening. And, and, I, have, and I, I can say that, you know, we have a number of individuals who uh, who, have, who will participate 
And also we have, I'm sure a number of people uh, lined up. Uh, and if I can look at the monitor, there are around 56 for participants who will be who will listening to this particular session. So uh, uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, present uh, the first speaker. And I, I'm not sure whether it will be Anhara who will be announcing the names. Uh, is that Anhara? Will you be doing that, or will it be? Uh, will, will you leave it to me to do to the introduction? Sir, I leave it to you. But if you want, I can do it for you. Uh, I would say that you're probably more prepared for, for this. I would say that please go ahead and introduce each of the speakers and, and I'll be there to help assist you in whatever way I can. So with, with those words, I welcome you all to this particular session and, and, and I hope we will enjoy and also learn a lot from the experts who, have, who, who, are, who will be speaking this evening. Thank you very much, Anna. Anhara, please take over. Thank you. Anhara, the housekeeping and the photo, please. Photo session. Sure. So um, can, can I request all of you to turn on your um, camera so that we can take a picture? Has the photo been taken, um, the comms team? Okay, thank you. So, um, I would like to call um, Sir uh, Dr. Rohan De Souza to uh, to present a paper on what engineering cannot tell us about modern large dams and why the social sciences have their secrets. Dr. Rohan D'Souza, are you there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I, am, I, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. You uh, are. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first, I, sh I should start by uh, uh, warmly thanking the, uh, uh, the host for inviting me to give this uh, short keynote. Um, Unfortunately, I think I overstretched the title a bit. It should just be uh, the first line uh, and uh, what engineers uh, don't know about large dams. The, the second part is a little more complex and I should have uh, uh, phrased it better. Um, I'm going to uh, convey this through a PowerPoint. And so uh, let me know if this is the, if you can see the PowerPoint, is that, uh, is, is that uh, is that uh, possible? I mean, uh, is there a problem with this? Yes, can you see? What? Yes, can you see? Oh, all right. Okay, great. So, uh, do I do this? Um, I can. Okay. Uh, and um, there is a. Is that is that all right? Uh, do I need to make any changes? There's something that you flip around, right? This is okay. This is this okay. Is okay. Oh, all right. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. All right. Um, so uh, my title is uh, What Engineering Cannot Tell Us About um, Modern Large Dams. Um, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, um, I had to, uh, um, um, you know, say uh, uh, it's not, not terribly strikingly original stuff, uh, but, but sometimes it's good to um, uh, pose the problems, um, the same problems differently, yeah? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to do something of, of that sort. So let me start. Um, all right. Uh, one of the um, important uh, aspects about large dams um, is there's a there's a there's a sense of when they really pick up tempo and surge, and much of the literature and the writings now suggest that it's really the the 1930s TVA project in the United States. Uh, this is when uh, the idea of the modern large dam really takes off. Uh, you have uh, dams earlier, but actually modern dams, uh, as we understand it today, is really a product of the 1930s uh, in terms of as an, as an ideology, as, a, as an engineering worldview, and many other uh, very defining features that today we, we take for granted. Um, 
Now, uh, what does happen is that, um, sorry, I'm just going to make sure. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, that uh, that uh, part of the uh, logic of the modern large dam is that it catches on uh, big time in South Asia. Um, and you, of course, have uh, uh, the, the very famous uh, Nehruvian kind of uh, statement about uh, large dams being temples of uh, modern India. And uh, many of these dams are aligned to ideas about progress, about nation building, and about uh, development uh, in general. So um, it comes at a time like in the 1940s and 50s, um, it's seen as very neutral, as very technical, uh, something above politics, and uh, really uh, something to do with um, uh, the project of decolonization all across South Asia. So it, it comes uh, in a very good box and is packaged uh, very well. But uh, what we go on to, uh, before we go on to see uh, how uh, uh, the, the story actually plays out, I wanted to flag how some of the engineers actually begin to describe and discuss dams. And this is just two instances. There are many, and you would find uh, several writings that are very similar to what I'm just going to uh, briefly read out. Uh, uh, one is uh, John L. Savage, um, uh, someone who did incredible work in China and in the US, and like many other engineers of that time, toured across the world. This is what he writes, and it's just an introduction to that mindset. So he says, when I first went out to the Snake River Valley, I saw only a river and a lot of wasteland. After the dam was up, the land changed. It got water, farmers moved in to work the soil, crops grew, then came villages and towns. That's why I think this is the happiest, most thrilling work in the world. You know, you get engineers really um, uh, convinced and committed to the idea that what they're doing is, um, is a kind of a quantum civilizational contribution. Yeah. And um, you see this as well with uh, David uh, Livienthal, uh, again, a very big player. Uh, he was the director of the um, of the um, um, TVA for some time. Uh, he traveled a lot in South Asia, met Nehru uh, and many other world leaders. Um, and he writes it in one of his um, uh, write, uh, writings, uh, rivers that in the violence of floods menace the land and the people, then sulk in idleness and drought. Rivers all over the world waiting to be controlled by men. And when he uses the word men, he really means men. The engineers are mostly men, yeah? The Yangtze, the Ganges, the Ob, the Parana, the Amazon, the Nile, just waiting to be controlled and brought to heal and harnessed for all their benefits. Yeah? So uh, these two quotes uh, kind of indicate somewhat uh, the direction uh, that many engineers uh, saw their, uh, their, uh, their, their view of themselves and their field of engineering. But, you know, this kind of enthusiasm and this, um, this belief in a kind of a technical solution to uh, problems of nation building, progress and development, if you, uh, as it were, comes really crashing by the 1980s and 1990s. And just to uh, one slice, India again, um, you'll see a huge number of protests breaking out uh, by the 1990s, uh, completely challenging that optimism that these engineers conveyed um, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And uh, now this is, a, um, is an interesting uh, moment that uh, you get uh, a questioning uh, of dams uh, by uh, communities who are not only being displaced, but people challenging those ideas of what means, de what development means and what progress means and challenging the engineering vision uh, in, 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 in many ways. Now, um, in fact, by 2001 and, and, and 1999, uh, you can see what I would argue, uh, these two books really capture that, that mood, uh, Silence Rivers of Patrick McCulley a detailed, systematic, um, if you wade through that book, um, he's got all the, the grievances, all the criticisms, all the mass movements, very systematically documented, uh, basically telling us that 
the, the dams are really sources for uh, for opposition and 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 uh, and that there are various uh, problems with uh, the kinds of impacts that they are causing. You have, of course, Arundhati Roy, who really conveys a strong sense of the politics that comes with large dams. So, roughly, um, if you were to just juxtapose those high uh, understanding of John Savage or of David Lilienthal, and I can think of many other engineers, Conversain or Ian Coastline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see this complete reversal of that, uh, that um, uh, belief and those arguments. Yeah? Now, the point I want to make, um, and of course, uh, I just want to add, uh, this is not a plug for me, but um, you know, scholarship actually usually lags by a couple of, uh, by a decade at least behind good uh, activism and good, uh, um, you know, uh, challenges on the ground. So you get at least for South Asia, that's for India, two uh, very, um, um, both historians, uh, academic uh, works that actually bring uh, to bear um, the uh, how complicated and how unfounded many of the uh, engineering claims were. And that actually the optimism and the enthusiasm that many of these engineers conveyed, they were assembling them in the fully knowing that there were many facts that were not fitting their, uh, their, uh, their vision, yeah? Okay, so there was a lot of forgetting as they went out to, to sell these incredible uh, dreams of progress through large dams. Now, the point I'm, um, I'm really trying to make is that this is, this is a terrain that's really well-documented, well, I mean, people have been, um, you know, uh, putting forward uh, these arguments, but I'm, I'm using this as a backdrop to make uh, another point. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is today, we actually have the balance sheet. It's very clear. There is no mystery. There is no secret. Uh, there's no complication. Uh, we do know that large dams do the following. They displace people. They, um, they uh, you know, uh, lots of forests get uh, chopped off. There are problems of salinity, water logging, uh, that often the benefits uh, don't really outweigh the costs. Uh, that even in the, uh, for example, in the uh, zones where uh, these engine, uh, the uh, uh, we call um, electricity, hydroelectricity is supposed to go, or uh, irrigation is supposed to go, even in in the in the what is the command zone, there are uh, environmental co consequences and complications and so on. So, so it is a story that's very very uh, complicated, very well documented, and frankly speaking, today. Uh, large dams no longer can, can actually make the case that they are going to be somehow environmentally sound or that they're going to respond to environmental questions. If you see, there's been a, a large a chain of change of tone. Today, many of the arguments for large dams are coming from climate change. Uh, people arguing that, oh, it's going to bring down, uh, bring down the, uh, uh, the carbon emissions. Uh, it's a replacement, it's a renewable technology, it's a replacement to, uh, to big oil and dirty oil, um, uh, dirty energy, so to speak. But it's not, um, uh, the cost benefit analysis and all that, that game is over because nobody can get the numbers to add up. So if today any government or any engineer wishes to make a case for large dams based on cost benefit analysis or on engineering that can address environmental complications, it's over. They, they, they are, they are, they, are, they will not be able to really make the case, and and there's now enough substantial work to to challenge that. But what I wanted to get at is a far more uh, difficult uh, question that is still out there, and that is, um, what is a large dam? Now that we know this story, uh, the initial optimism of engineers, uh, popular people's movements. Uh, the whole balance sheet of costs and uh, benefits. Having now that we know all this, how do you define a large dam? And this is what I'm going to attempt today. Um, all right. So my definition is: large dams are the technical means for transforming a local endowment into a natural mm -hmm. resource, in order to then transfer that resource to, um, sorry, I, I can't seem to read that. 
transfer uh, in order to, to then move that resource to meet the demands of a more powerful constituency. I'm just going to repeat this again. Large dams are the technical means for transforming a local endowment into a natural resource in order to then move that resource to meet the demands of a more powerful constituency. Let me just break that down very quickly. Um, uh, I see this as a two part. Um, when I say transform a local endowment, it's about, um, um, in some ways, it involves a certain amount of violence um, in uh, destroying uh, life worlds uh, in order to make those life worlds uh, then into things. Uh, it is to transform uh, through language and concepts, the qualities of local endowments into abstract numbers. Now, what I want to explain by that is that often if you see the debate on large dams, the first thing that local communities lose is their ability to discuss their rivers in their own terms. Their language becomes obsolete. Their language becomes ignorance. Their uh, concepts and sense of those rivers are considered non-scientific and therefore something that should be dismissed. So in one of the interesting things that engineers do and have done is that they have delegitimized other ways of knowing local, uh, 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 other ways of knowing about rivers, the local endowment, yeah? The entire histories, the associations, the way people have understood what is their local endowment. That is transformed into something quite bloodless, quite abstract, it becomes a thing, it becomes a resource. And it's then calculated in a way that actually uh, a community of fishermen or a subsistence uh, cultivator or uh, riverbank people, they have no uh, access to that way of thinking. So they are often told this will yield so many kilowatts of electricity, don't stand in the way of national progress. But what that river is, is now going to be debated even when they go to courts. And I, and I uh, will come back to the issue of rights. Even when they go to the courts, it's, it's a language that's already loaded against them. No court is going to take them seriously if somebody says, oh, this is the river in which, uh, you know, our favorite elephant used to take a bath. I mean, that's irrelevant. Yeah. So qualities become abstract numbers. They become quantities. Yeah. And they, the river becomes a thing. It becomes a resource. When it becomes a resource, it can be calculated, manipulated, and uh, added up in ways that are inconceivable when it is a river of qualities and a river of life worlds, yeah? So I want to underline that point. Now I come to the second part. Uh, and I want to underline, sorry, I, I, I forgot to mention this. Uh, you know, uh, one uh, book that is actually very, very instructive, if you want to think like this, is uh, Imtiaz Ahmed's uh, People of Many mm -hmm. Rivers. So this book is interesting because what they did was they went and met people who lived next to rivers and just collected their life stories. And from those life stories, you can see uh, complex, multi-dimensional relationships with rivers. All right, yeah? Uh, this is not a um, couple of policy experts or engineers or academics such as myself sitting behind uh, tables and in front of computers hundreds of miles away and talking about the fate of a river, yeah? This is a very lived in, embedded sensib sensibility about what a river means or a ecological endowment means, yeah? And if you were to just thumb through this, at some level, they are very micro stories, very simple, uh, spoken in a language that people can, you know, convey themselves in. But if you add it up, if you kind of pay attention to the book, uh, and I believe there would be some problems of translation and, you know, ethnographies are always uh, complicated in their own right. But if you were to put it down, uh, think about what you've read, Come back to read again, you'd see that there's an entire life world, a cosmology that is that that comes out through the course of uh, how people talk about their rivers, yeah, uh, which is very different from a David Lilienthal or or how uh, an Arthur Morgan or, or you know I, I, or JL Savage and so on would discuss rivers, yeah. So um, I want to underline that. Now the second part. 
uh, is that technologies are transferred to more powerful constituencies. The violence is not only at one level that you've taken a, uh, a local endowment and made it into a natural resource. But after you've done that, you now do it because once it's disentangled from life worlds, it can become a dead uh, quantity, a dead resource that can be moved anywhere you want it to go, right? So you build, uh, you use concrete, you use steel, you use iron, pipes, turbines, and you move it around to whoever has the capacity to pull it in their direction. So often you get uh, electricity going to cities, uh, irrigation water going to uh, monocropping farming, yeah? Uh, you get the rhetoric of nation building, but you can make that water go wherever you want it to go, yeah? So, but it's always invariably, it's not transferred to a less powerful constituency, it's transferred to a, a more powerful constituency. So you have the violence of language, the violence of concepts, the end of life worlds, the end of cosmologies, the end of qualities, and the resurrection of uh, resource, of things, of quantities, and power. Yeah, you get that, that shift. So I would like to just put it uh, in a slightly blunt fashion. So you have uh, three aspects uh, that I'm going to underline here. One is you'll get in the whole story of large dams, you will get the initial period progress, nation building, development. You, you get a lot of that rhetoric from engineers. Uh, then you get the challenge, uh, which talks about environmental degradation and inequality. I mean, these are the oppositions to large dams. Uh, but within the environmental degradation narrative and inequality, there is a sense that people can negotiate with this and we can still get some sort of desirable outcomes from large dams, yeah? So you get cost benefit analysis, you get fair compensation discussions, you get public uh, uh, you know, um, uh, meetings, you get uh, the debate on good dams, there's a good dam, let's not throw it out. You get environmental impact assessment, the beautiful world of the expert, the educated, uh, you know, the person who knows uh, numbers, mathematics, economics, and ecology. Yeah? So you get all these experts who can really craft uh, that middle ground, right? But my argument is that if you go by the definition that I've uh, advanced, I see this as really technologies as a problem of politics and injustice. And the core is about trying to understand uh, language, power, and ideology. So uh, uh, in some senses, I'm arguing that the, the, the large dam story, and, and I'm not of course saying something new, but in terms of an emphasis, I'm, try, I'm trying to underline that um, this, uh, it's not fundamentally about impacts, that if we get into the rabbit hole of impacts, there's really uh, many ways in which the large dam story can still win, yeah? But uh, if you really want to understand the, the, the part that engineering just refuses to engage with, then it's not about impacts, it's about relationships. Relationships between nature, domination, control, and injustice, yeah? Uh, and ideology, essentially, yeah? That's the domain that engineers really, or engineering, I should be more correct, that engineering really uh, does, not, um, does not actually know about large dams. It does not know it as an ideology. It does not study it as a relationship between nature and humans. And you know, it doesn't really look very keenly at domination, control, and injustice. Um, engineering can still intervene on questions of impacts. Yeah. Um, and impacts which still carries the violence of the loss of language and loss of life worlds. Yeah. But not so much when you uh, understand large dams mm -hmm. as essentially an ideological construction, yeah? Um, uh, I should end, uh, but by saying, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm very happy that the question of rights was brought up. Uh, I'm someone who's not convinced that rivers uh, should have rights. Um, and let me um, convey uh, that in a, in a different way. You know, um, uh, 
lawyers will have to speak for rivers. Yeah, uh, the rivers, you will never really know whether they've represented rivers correctly. Uh, for someone who comes from South Asia, uh, I do know that those who command resources often command the law. And often within the legal architecture, uh, in a very Kafkaesque sense, you can be denied uh, justice. Yeah. Uh, so I would focus uh, more on issues of justice and injustice, which, which I feel helps us recover uh, certain languages, certain sensibilities, certain uh, complexities that comes from life words, okay? Not from the elegance uh, or certitudes of law, yeah? Uh, so uh, uh, let me end by simply reiterating that uh, the large jam story, if understood really as a problem of relationships rather than impacts, uh, then we enter into the terrain of justice and injustice. I think. Dr. D'Souza, I'm sorry to intervene. Yeah, thank uh, you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, your very informative presentation. Um, uh, I would now like to invite Dr. Mansurul Kipria to share his presentation on Bangabundu Fisheries Heritage, a successful social initiative to conserve the river. Um, Dr. Manzur Kipria, sorry, are you there? With the permission oh, I, I of have, I the chair, Mr. Uh, Manzur, may I? Yes, I, I know that uh, uh, our colleague will not be able to attend, so please take uh, his place, Farah. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, his student will be presenting, but I just want to set the context why Mr. Uh, Dr. Kibria uh, is not uh, able to come. And he has apologized, but probably uh, it's important to share that he is an activist as well as a academician and a teacher. And he has been fighting for the rights of the, to save the Halda River. And uh, right now, uh, the Halda River is at risk and there's a special high level convoy from the Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Industries, Water Development Board, Chittagong municipality and other in authority who are trying to, um, you know, uh, take the uh, Holder River for uh, development purposes and take the water from there uh, for a proposed Mireshwara economic zone, which is almost 90 kilometer away from the Halder. Yet they still want to use the water from the Halder River. This decision will not only kill the river, but the amount of water extracted will not be adequate for the zone. And as a result, Halda and its natural resources will die and the economic zone will become a failure. So Mr. Dr. Kibri and his team are trying, are attending and trying to persuade the authorities to not take such action. So along with the um, a large dam and engineering uh, uh, solutions that uh, Dr. D'Souza was mentioning, the economic zone and other development um, projects can be equally harmful. So we have uh, Mr. Manzurul Kibria's student on board. Can our team connect him, please? He will be presenting. Honorable Chair, respected participants and delegates, Good evening. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present the paper on behalf of Dr. Manjul Kibriya on Bangabundu Fisheries Heritage, a successful social initiative to conserve the Halda River. My name is Abdullah Sheikh. I'm doing my MS in Department of Geology, University of Chicago. I'm presenting my presentation. Is that okay? Can I go on? Hello. Yes, please do. We can okay. see. The slide. Okay, thank you, thank you. You know, Halde is an indigenous river of Bangladesh. From higher fertilized eggs of cars, such as Roy, Katlam, Regal, Kalibaush are collected. It has a great economic contribution to our country, providing with fishery opportunities, freshwater reserve, water for the cultivation, communication, etc. Halda is mostly known for its character of being the calf's breeding ground. That means calves are necessarily breeds here 
it may be common in many rivers, but the exciting fact about the Halda River is this is the only river from where fertilized, fertilized eggs are being collected. It's rare in the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting you the four features of Halda River, Levi Ruhita, Katla Katla, Sirona Sirosas, and Levi Kalbasha. Here in this slide, you are seeing all the contribution of the Halda River. Halda River is the only natural carp spawning ground in Bangladesh, and as a only tidal river in the world, every year from this river, fertilized eggs of carbs are collected by the local fishermen and egg collectors between April and June. So this is an unique river. Halda River is, an, is the natural living, Halda River is the living natural gene bank and the sole breeding ground of the few Indian major carbs in Bangladesh. In other sources of the carbs, fishes become hybrids due to inbreeding problem. So any destruction of the river will accelerate the extinction of few breeds of those carbs from the whole world. And fertilized eggs of the Halda play a significant role in national economy. It contributes about 800 crores yearly. Halda is regarded as a lifeline of Chittagong as it is the main source of fresh water of Chittagong. She was a collect about 18 crore liter water daily from the Halda River to supply to the Chittagong city. And also this river is the habitat of Ganges River Dolphin or South Asian River Dolphin, which is locally known as Shushuk. And this is an endangered species of the world with a very few population. One of our recent study finds that we have about 126 species in our country, uh, in Halder River. And it is the largest number in our country. So what's the present status of the Halder River? Okay, Halder is not in good condition right now. We have to give more concern to this river. Here in this data, you can see that the number of the eggs are decreasing gradually. In 2016, we got zero fertilized eggs. The egg collection data clearly shows that the ecosystem of the Halda River is declining gradually and slow and rapidly. And now we are facing all these challenges in Halda River. One of the most important challenges in Halda River is the water withdrawal. There has been constructed a rubber dam over the Halda River at Buspur. There are about 18 unplanned construction of sluice gate and dam in different territories of the Halda River. As a result, the salinity of this river is increasing and this is a new threat for Halda, Halda's breeding ground. One of the another major challenges of Halda River is pollution and on the residential area is the of CDA is the main reason of pollution in Halda River. In previous time, industrial waste of Bazit to Kulga industrial area directly flows to the uh, polluted Konofuli River, but due to, uh, due to construction in Anunayabashik area, it, uh, now, nowadays it follows directly to the Halda River through Khandokia Khal. And also Asian pepper mill is another reason of Halda's pollution. They don't have any ATP and releases waste as in a canal who is falls directly to the Halda River. Gentlemen, you are seeing which stages here. Another reason for Halda's pollution is Hadadari Peak in power plant. Both of the construction is up now, are up now. Here are some newspaper report on Halda's pollution. We had recorded 22 that, that fish individuals due to pollution. One of the another traits for Halda is illegal broadfish killing. We're seeing some newspapers on it. We are working with the fishermen, egg collectors, local administration, NGO, and Halda River Conservation Committee to protect the illegal killing of broadfish. We're providing a speed boat to the authority to catch the greedy fisher fishermen and also providing mobile phone, torch light, and other accessories to the uh, volunteers and here is some pictures of coordination meeting and remuneration check distribution among the river volunteers. Another brick trace for Halda River is the straightening of Oxbow Ban. It destroys the fishery habitat. About 13 Oxbow Ban has been straightened over the 100 year. Tobuku culture of the upstream was a new challenge for us. As you know, Tobuku kills everything 
We have talked so many times about the Tobuku culture. Here is some pictures of Tobuku field of upstream Manikshari region. We have talked with the local farmers, create a new opportunity. And after a long struggle, we have got the 99% success. And I can show you these pictures. Here in this picture, you are seeing this picture is taken in 2017. Uh, in Tubuku, uh, here in this picture, you are seeing the Tubuku cultivation. And again, in this place, you are seeing the potato cultivation in uh, 2021. Another challenge for Halda is legal and illegal dredger. After a long time, and efforts, government banned dredging and suspended lease of 17 cent quarry at Halda and its tributaries according to dolphin post madam report equation. There is some pictures of that dolphin. From September 2017, we have recorded 27 unexpected death of dolphin. We have done first dolphin post madam collaboration with the Bangladesh Agricultural University, Sivasu, Ministry of Fisheries and Livestock, Department of Environment and Department of Forest at Halda River Research Laboratory for investigating the reason of death. We have given an investigation report on dolphins death with five step recommendation to Ministry of Fisheries and Livestock. Maximum reason of dolphins death was, was mechanical trauma. Here shows another dolphin which was killed to collect fact. Due to illegal killing of dolphin, a rich petition has been filed to the High Court Division of Honorable Supreme Court and by the court order, there has been formed a committee co to conserve the dolphin led by the DC of Chittagong. According to the part of the Dolphin Conservation Program, we have celebrated International Freshwater Dolphin Day collaboration with Ministry of Forestry and Environment. How few have participated to address this problem? Okay, well, first of all, we formed Halda River Conservation Committee, including some members of civil society in 2007. We have created a website named Halda River dot org done several reports and research publication we have conducted lots of seminars symposium workshops in the same in last 20 years we have created group praises in social media media to popularize the conservation issue among the young peoples we have made documentary video named halda and mysterious river to our halda river stockholder with the support of action aid bangladesh we involved electronic and print media. There is some popular TV program of, about Halda River. We involved local community, students, researchers, nature loving people, and civil society. Also, we also we communicated with the government authorities and different relevant ministry to solve several issues about Halda. Last year, a movie named Halda was made with our help. We have established Halda River Research Laboratory. It is the first single river-based laboratory in our country. Okay, due to COVID-19, environmental destruction was at a low rate. So we have seen a huge collections of eggs in 2020, which was about 25,536 kg and broke the previous records of 14 years. Under considering the unique characters and our movements and demand, finally, Halda got the recognition of Bangabundu fisheries heritage. But the problem is not finished yet. Currently, Siwasa is collecting 18 crore liter water daily from the Halda River and another 24 liter crore liter water is collected by the Halda Parallel Project. Both the project is running and they're planning to take another 14 crore liter water from the Halda River. This is about 30% of the whole river. And this is like a suicidal activity for the Halda. Safe Halda River, said no to them and resin. Thank you everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ashik, for sharing your presentation. Uh, I would now like to invite Mr. Adil Kayum Mullah, research scholar from University of Kashmir, to share his presentation on Bangladesh River Right, contesting the Tista water. Uh, 
Mr. Adil, are you there with us? Yes, I am there, ma'am. Yes. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. So this is Adil Koyum from University of Kashmir, India. And first of all, I am extremely sorry that I was not able to join this digital platform on my personal computer because of some internet problems here in Kashmir. So I am joining it from my smartphone and I have my fingers crossed that my phone bears with me for next half an hour or so. And, and I will try to share my screen as well, and I will try my level best to make sure that it, this exercise is as interactive as possible. So I have titled my talk, my presentation titled uh, Bangladesh's River Right, Contesting the Tista Waters. And uh, actually, I have framed it on a resource conflict paradigm that uh, how resource conflicts has emerged as a bone of co contention between the riparian status at the moment and uh, the other kinds of uh, states or stakeholders as of now. So we all know that resources have been the lifeline of civilizations right from the word go. And uh, the Settled communities in the world were first of all uh, based on river banks or other water resources as such. And if we have uh, an analysis of the resource conflicts in the previous century and the current century as well, we have seen majority of the active conflicts have either been on oil or on water. So taking it through a resource conflict paradigm, I have made my first slide that is a resource as a source of conflict. And I'm drawing from Michael Kallier and Giordano's analysis of resource conflicts in Middle East and in South Asia. So basically there are three areas or there are three factors which essentially affect the resource conflicts between the nations. And the first factor is the resource sovereignty is ill-defined or non-existent. Usually resource emerges as a source of conflict in areas where resource sovereignty is not defined in the strict sense. And the second is if the existing political institutions are destroyed by the political change. For example, if there is a regime change, if there is a coup d'etat, or if there is another institutional regimes or institutional mechanisms have been destroyed, there the vulnerability to resource conflict is increased. And the third thing is that if the changes, rapid changes in the resource environments outpace the capacity of institutions to deal with the change. For example, if we have had such kind of a demand supply mechanism where we are not able to deal with the resource supply or the resource demand. Michael Clear from Hampshire College discusses that increase in worldwide demand for resources, which is fueled in large part by the increase in the global population. And the second is looming shortages of vital commodities such as oil, natural gas, water, timber, and minerals. And the third is continuous and increasing tendency for nations to contest ownership rights over resources. So transboundary water issues, lining transboundary waters on the paradigm of resource conflict theory is giving us a typical picture as far as South Asian scenario is concerned. In South Asia, transboundary waters have emerged as one of the major bone of contention between the riparian nations. And uh, I think Kofi Annan's 2001 
remark has been quite prophetic when he said that fierce competition over fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. And uh, if we draw on Imtiaz Ahmed Ajay Dikshit and Ashish Nandi's 1990s document, which was titled the South Asian Manifesto. Thank you. Thank you very much. The South Asian Manifesto on the politics and knowledge of water, it has simply assumed that over the past 50 years of water management in South Asia has been a story of unfolding disaster. So transboundary water issues have become an issue of high politics in South Asia. And transboundary river basins are a prominent feature of the South Asian physical landscape cutting across political boundaries and are therefore of paramount importance to the region's geopolitical stability. But what are the implications, what are the nuances, what are the underpinnings that are hidden in a transboundary hydropolitical dyad? That is the question to be answered. The hydropolitical conflict between the two states is highly determined by the riparian position of the states. And this uh, riparian position ultimately decides what kind of a stance, what kind of a strategy a particular state, a particular country will take when it comes to sharing the transboundary waters. And the claims and counterclaims among states involved in disputes over surface waters follow a set pattern that diverge sharply according to riparian states of the states. If we put India and Bangladesh into the same structure, we can simply say that India, being an upper riparian, is having a different kind of a value set when it comes to sharing Tista waters. And the same applies to Bangladesh. Being a lower riparian, Bangladesh is highly depends on Tista, and it is a, a northern region, to be exact. That is that Lal Monirhat, Gai Banda, Kurigram, Dinajpur, etc. They are extremely and entirely dependent on the Tista waters. So, Tista water dispute has emerged as one of the major transboundary water disputes between India and Bangladesh at the moment. And if we have a look at the Tista water dispute, I have to make a few arguments before coming to the crux, before coming to the central idea of our debate. I would love to invoke Peter Molinga as one of the major or you can say one of the important analysis about transboundary waters. And that is, if we have a look at transboundary water conflicts in South Asia in particular, and the globe, all over the globe in general, we have come to the typical analysis where the transboundary hydropolitical dyads revolve around a set of variables. And to quote Peter Kalik, he says, the first of the variables is the ratio of water demand to supply. So how much the supply demand gap is there? If it's not that much, if that much hiatus does not exist between the supply and the demand, then the water conflict can be resorted to simply. But if the hiatus between demand and supply is too large, then it can escalate into a big conflict. And the second is, the water availability per person. And if we use Falkenmark's index on South Asia, we come to the conclusion that South Asia is on the brink of water stress. And if we look at Bangladesh, Bangladesh from a bird's eye view looks like a very much water abundant nation. But if we have a different perspective, that is the external dependency ratio, how much Bangladesh relies on the waters coming from outside its territorial jurisdiction, then the situations are very, very much 
alarming. Bangladesh's external dependence ratio is more than 90% of it, its annual recharge. So taking into consideration these kinds of arguments or these kinds of analysis, we can simply say that Bangladesh has to have a, an active hydro diplomatic plan to deal with India when it comes to sharing the Tista waters. Because Tista water does not mean only for its river, or it's not all about the generation of hydropower or etc. It's all about the people who are relying entirely on the waters, the people who are engulfed in the river basin. And that's what the right of the Bangladesh is vis-a-vis Tita, Tista water dispute. Because if we look at the diplomatic scenario which has unfolded over the years between India and Bangladesh, we have come to a conclusion that Bangladesh, being a lava riparian, has not been given the exact water share which it really, really deserves of long. So I would love to cut it short in a five minutes or so. That uh, so transboundary water disputes usually follow a set agenda or a set scenario, which, as I already said, is eventually determined by the riparian positions of the states. But the question arises, does the riparian position of the state mean that it will not give anything to its downstream nations? So that's where the uh, David Schlossberg's environmental justice concept com comes in. That if we look at the basin-wide approach, if we look at the overall basin, then it should be the overall population and the overall dependence on the river should be taken into consideration. So finally, to cut it short, that uh, the geographical location of the upper riparian state and nation states and the lower riparian nation states by itself embeds an asymmetrical system in the river basin. And the terms of nation, na natural geography in the context of sharing a transboundary river is something that one cannot escape. So this is the cruel reality underlying the famous boundary water resources. And I would love to conclude by saying that, that Bangladesh needs a high level of hydro-political diplomacy to make sure that it is getting what it deserves as far as Tista waters are concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adil, uh, for sharing your presentation. I would now like to invite Dr. Ainun Nishat, sir, Professor Emeritus Center for Climate Change and Environmental Research, Bragg University, to share your reflection on the presentations and also share a few words with us on your decades of experience on rights of river. So over to you. Um, thank you very much, Anhara. And thank you, um, the organizers, Section 8, for inviting me. And I'm in a very confused state. Number one, I've been given only 10 minutes. And verbally, I had been advised to talk about the theme of this workshop or this, this session today, which is about right of rivers, which is my fate, uh, favorite topic. And I like to defend the right of the river. And then we had uh, four presentations. Um, uh, or did I have three? Three. One on dams, one on the Halda, and one on the Tista. Uh, and I could spend a um, substantial amount of time on these three presentations because of my personal involvement and um, experience with all the three, three, three studies. Having said that, I will possibly spend more time on rights of rivers, which the organizers want me to speak. My opening statement is I am a civil engineer, I am a water resources engineer, and I'm very proud to be engineer. Nothing wrong with engineering. Who decides? Who decides that the Halda water should be taken from Halda by 100 kilometers and taken to an industrial zone that is being built? Is it the engineers? No, it is the policymakers. And the policymakers can be the politician or the bureaucrat who is in charge. 
the engineers have one fault, which is they love to construct, which is wrong. They must manage. I used to teach water resources management practices many years back in Buet. And when I was teaching the course on planning, I used to highlight the environmental issues, the social issues, ecological issues, institutional issues, economic issues. The decision that it will, it will be taken based on benefit and cost ratio is a very, very old, old approach. This is no longer valid. But in governments like Bangladesh, where the governments are uh, cannot decide on their own, often depend on the donors or often depend on the powerful policy group, powerful groups, they take decisions which are being criticized in the name of engineering. I'm very sorry to say, Mr. Rohan D'Souza, you have been, you are talking about some of the material that were discussed or debated between 1997 and 2000, when the World Commission on Dams were formed and the solutions were given. And I know there is one problem in Bangladesh is about language. A dam which uh, obstructs the flow and confines the flow is a dam and an embankment is something which is parallel to the river. Now there is big global campaign against dam, though China and other countries are building many, as the same Bangla word called Bad which is parallel to the river. So the ill effects of a dam has been transposed on the ill effects as the ill effects on an embankment. And there were a lot of debates that whether we should have embankments or not. And my position was that if the embankment is bad, let's go and demolish them. Anyway, I would like to go back to your comment, but since you said you don't like the word right of the river, let me re def defend the rivers here. And I'm familiar with the with uh, Manzurul Kibria's work. And if you go through the literature cited in in that particular the, the work done by Manzurul Kibria, you'll find a lot of references of mine where we I fully agree with what they are pushing for. And uh, I even don't like the cutoffs, which I used to teach how to do a cutoff in an environmentally sound manner. On the Tista. Uh, again, the question is, is the water surplus? Now, here is a problem. The non-engineers like to take the annual flow. On an annual basis, Tista has more flow than it is needed by both by India and Bangladesh. It is a seasonal variability, which is not really considered um, in the, when they debate. Uh, that is the tragedy, is the tragedy. If you have high monsoon flow, if you want to conserve some of it in an environmentally sound manner, in a socially responsible manner, it is possible to do it. And then you can reduce the conserved flow in the lean period and increase the flow. The fight with Tista is not going to be solved even when the agreement is signed. No way, no way. This is a political move by the government of Bangladesh and politically government of India has agreed that Bangladesh has a right. It's a political problem that Chief Minister of West Bengal does not agree. And the Tista has been turned to a zero flow river, almost zero flow river, which is of course, which has killed the ecosystem and everything else. So I was surprised to, when I saw the program, Mr. Adil coming from Kashmir would be talking about a problem in on the other side of Indian territory. But I agree with his conclusion, but we need to, we, we also can have a solution. And the solution is to conserve the monsoon flow. And for that, again, we need a high dam. So you, you can create more problems by constructing a high dam. To my knowledge, those dams should be created or constructed in uh, Sikkim and the government of Sikkim is very much interested. But anyway, I'm not going into that. So what is what do I mean by right of the river? The river has a right to flow as a as it was flowing without being harmed. If three attributes to the river system, A, B and C, A means abiotic, which is the physical um, dimension or physical property, B means biotic, which is the biological 
um, aspect, the ecosystem aspect, and C is the chemical aspect, which is the quality of water. Now, the many countries, in many countries, there was a fight going on for the right of the river to maintain the river. And the starting point was in New Zealand, where the local communities wanted to protect the, a particular river in New Zealand. From religious point of view, the river was God to them. And they didn't want to see the river being disturbed. And, uh, and it took them 40, 50 years to win. And now the in the, uh, New Zealand's constitution ensured that the river would not be disturbed in any way. Um, then the second set of countries are from Central America, which is uh, Ecuador and, and, and uh, three, four countries in that area, where the rivers were being destroyed by mining operation. The sand and rocks were dumped into the river and blocking the river. And government formed this right of the river that the river has the right to flow, which I said the abiotic condition or the physical condition is flow must continue. And then C, which the ecological um, uh, people talk about the chemical quality of water uh, that is connected to B, which is the biotic condition. Interestingly, in India, they fail to recognize the right of the river or what is to be done with the river. The government of Uttaranchal uh, issued a proclamation protecting the right of the river Ganga. And within one month, the Indian Supreme Court vacated this decision. So in India, right of the river is not recognized as of today. Um, some friends of India often course that India has um, done this and that, which is not the correct information. Then in Bangladesh, um, in 2009, um, the Justice Khairul Haq had the first proclamation about the physical dimension of the river must be protected. And then recently, last year, they had another law where they have wanted the rivers to be considered as living being. And the river commission has been appointed as guardian because the rivers cannot speak. Now, why I am saying this? A river does not carry only water. It carries only sediment. And there must be a balance between water and sediment. If the discharge gets lower, its sediment carrying capacity gets lower and the river gets silted up. The reverse is also true. If we manually or somehow reduce the discharge, the flow of the, the flow of the river, then the width of the river and the depth of the river would get reduced. This is what is happening in the coastal belt of Bangladesh. Why Bhavodaho was underwater this year and also in previous year? Because the tidal cubature or the flow has been reduced through construction of polders. And result is the river width has gone up and the river width has gone up. And the right of the river means the right of the people living on the bank of it. So you need to understand the behavior of the river, the physics of the river behavior, which a geomorphologist would understand, a geographer would understand, a geologist would understand. And of course, an engineer would understand whether you like the engineers or not. But point is, solution is, you need to pay attention to the natural balance of the river. You can withdraw some water, especially you can withdraw when the water is surplus. You can conserve that and you can supply the water when the water is in short in supply. And there will be tremendous demand on the water in the dry season because for food security, you have to provide irrigation and also to protect the crops, you also need flood management through the dike. So these are all complex situation. So you need to develop good understanding of the river mechanics. You need to develop good understanding on the environmental flow. This is a concept which is just being developed and coming up. It was not there in the 90s or in the uh, 50s when Bakranangal Dam and um, Tennessee Valley Authority was created. So these knowledges are being created. I taught them in the 90s. And um, often I could feel my students were laughing at me because in those days, environmental concerns were not there very prominent. But in the universities, they are teaching it. You go to Rurki, definitely they are, they, are, they are teaching all these things. So it is the right to flow, right to have the proper cross-section, proper water quality, and the proper life inside it, which is the ecosystem. Incidentally, one of the main uh, element of ecosystem is the fish. And the fish breeding season in Bangladesh is at a time when the flow is very low. 
in Tista, if I just give one name, is the fish called Boirali or Piali in Shirazgan. It is, it is totally vanishing. The aquatic life through in the form of turtles and dolphins and others, all are going to be dead. So, uh, because there is no flow for part of the period. Now, instead, the problem is not with high dam. Problem is the way it is designed. The, there are a number of powerful NGOs who are pushing for um, run of the river type structure to produce hydropower. Now, the Indian Environmental, uh, the Green Court has given a ruling very correctly that if you have series of run of the river uh, type of small dams, they create a pulsating flow on the riverbed, not a steady flow. So you need to take into account the ecological consideration, the into the social consideration. Often the high dams are constructed in areas which is um, inhabited by tribal people and they don't have large voice. <laughs> These are all documented in the World Commission on Dams report, which was well represented by an Indian professional. And in fact, the person who coordinated the whole exercise, Akim Steiner, is now head of UNDP. So how to construct a dam? And uh, there has been a lot of studies, lots of report, and one of the finest report I have read was prepared in Nepal by Ajay Muni Dixit and Deepak Gawali um, on behalf of IUCN. If we have to go for a high dam to meet the political will of the political masters or the policy makers, then how do you go for the engineering structure without annoying many experts or many social scientists like Orunduti Roy or Medha Patekar? Then since the name came to my mind right now, they fought against Normuda Dam. They actually fought against the height of the dam, not against the dam. So they wanted to limit the height of the dam and it was constructed accordingly. Now I see there has been movement in Madhya Pradesh, how to increase the height of the dam. But uh, just to conclude, uh, when Mr. Adil was, Adin Malla was discussing about Tista, he made a very strong point and very good point, very honest point, which is everything depends on the position of the riparian. Why there is a big fight between Andhra and Telangana? I'm giving an example from India because Mr. I assume Mr. Rohan D. Suja is familiar with this sort of argument. Is Telangana is the um, uh, upper riparian and Andhra is the lower riparian and Andhra was worried that um, Telangana could uh, disturb their flow through the river system going down into the sea. And even Indian Supreme Court had to come to rescue to, to solve this problem. And I don't think if the problem is solved. Now, going back, uh, my last comment would be about the role of the politician and role of the um, uh, role of the um, who takes the decision. Now, in Halda, when the EIA was done by a reputed consulting group of Bangladesh called IWM, Institute of Water Modeling, I'm ashamed. I feel ashamed because IWM had produced that stupid report their group of engineers, but it was uh, the ecologist and biologist and social scientist and institutional specialist who conducted that study. And based on that, they now want to transfer water to 100 kilometer. While I gave in many interviews, the options are there. There are other sources of water and water can be conserved and the supply could be made. Somebody wanted to do this project, bigger projects with bigger money, and somebody is, is happy on that. So. Um, point is, then the activists got together, supported by some bureaucrat, and they declared as the Bangabandhu uh, Fisheries Reserve or um, um, Ecosystem Reserve, and uh, still fight is going on. So despite one part of the government supporting that no, no water should be withdrawn and the ecosystem should be supported, and the demand of the ecosystem is in the driest season, driest part. Let me conclude by saying one thing. In water management, for God's sake, never consider the average flow annually or do not consider the peak flow. Consider it period by period, month by month, because these rivers carry a very low flow and then again a very high flow. Both are problematic. How can we balance them? 
you need to have some intervention, but the intervention should be ecologically friendly, socially sustainable, economically and other characteristics must be met. Maybe you have to relocate the structure. Hydropower is cheap and pollution free. See Nepal is sitting on 50 to 100,000 megawatts of hydropower and they are having load shedding and uh, they, are, they are suffering from shortage of um, energy. And the other point I would like to make to my friend from who has talked about on, on Halda, salinity is increasing. The salinity is going to increase. All the rivers which are connected to the sea in any form, whether directly or indirectly, sea level rise is going to impact. So the increase in salinity in Halda up to the Halda bridge on the corner of Fuli Road uh, or Kaptai Road is due to sea level rise, which as of today, the sea level rises by one meter. When it becomes about two meters by 2050, it, the problem would be even more. We need to understand the rivers holistically. We are often, we talk about in support of the river or against the river. By against the river, I mean, mean the engineering in, in interventions. We become very emotional, but we need to have logical solution a balanced solution, but definitely ecological consideration and social consideration should dominate. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing a glimpse of your vast experience with us. Um, every time we hear from you, it enlightens us and inspires us to strengthen our work on achieving the rights of rivers. Uh, we shall now move to the question and answer session. Considering the time limitation, we can only take a few questions. So the first question is to Dr. D'Souza. Um, the question is, reflecting on the role of rivers as a resource or a part of people's way of life, how we could balance the roles of river in terms of justice and development. Dr. D'Souza. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, you know, that's a very big question. Um, I, I feel that I should uh, just partly respond to Dr. Nishad's excellent and really uh, compelling presentation. And I'm sorry, I might have conveyed myself in a very hurried and inadequate manner. And uh, I might have given the impression that I'm speaking against engineering, which is not my case, yeah, uh, which is not what I wanted to convey. So I'm sorry for that misunderstanding. Um, um, in my in my writings, uh, I, I have I have located my arguments uh, in in a, in a different way. But but just to come back to the point, just to clarify, you know what I'm trying to say is that if you look at how engineering visions around large dams emerged. They emerged with ideas of progress, of development, and of uh, you know uh, a certain uh, sense of um, uh, what do you call uh, 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 you know um, controlling uh, rivers and so on and so forth. They, they emerged with those those kinds of visions. Um, what I'm arguing uh, is that uh, those visions have been challenged by popular movements. Uh, saying that, you know, that there was this other side, which you've also pointed out correctly, and actually we are both on the same team, that there's, there's lots of ways in which you can uh, question those notions of uh, uh, progress and benefits, you know, like, for example, what you pointed out to on uh, ecological flows and so on and so forth. There are many technical aspects. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is slightly differently. I'm just saying that uh, for us to understand uh, justice issues requires us to have a very different definition of modern large dams. Uh, and that is what my presentation was trying to suggest, that, that actually the rights-based approach uh, might fit in uh, with the engineering view. It might fit in even with the uh, political opposition that has built against large dams, but it doesn't entirely address the question of justice, which is to locate rivers very meaningfully in life worlds of communities and people who depend or have histories and relationships with these rivers. I don't know, I might have, uh, but now to get back uh, to the question, uh, you know, there is no formula that I can offer uh, other than to suggest 
that uh, there are many knowledges about rivers and how people perceive what their benefits are. Like if you talk to fishing communities, you know, their notion of a flow uh, is very different from, say, uh, a farming community, right? Uh, very different from the hydroelectricity requirements. Often you find three different constituencies want different aspects of the river in different ways, right? And often we have found out that people who make demands for hydroelectricity tend to uh, cause uh, a loss for fishing communities. And we often find that uh, farming communities, which can be quite powerful, like in Punjab, uh, they, they uh, require water flows of a certain level often to the detriment of hydroelectricity. So there are these contests. But I don't want to take too much time, but I simply want to say that uh, let us think of life worlds, uh, documented uh, ethnography, anthropology, very important fields for us to develop new knowledges about rivers without necessarily saying that these new knowledges dismiss engineering, they don't. Uh, high engineering was very critical to shaping development and progress uh, ideas about managing rivers, yeah? So uh, I, let me conclude very quickly and say, this is not a criticism of engineering. This is actually a claim for bringing in life worlds into our understanding of rivers. I hope I got that across. Sorry, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. Um, we have a second question to Mr. Ashik. Uh, the question, is, is there any existing national agency that manages the development of Halda River? Mr. Ashik, over to you. Mr. Ashik, are you there? Can you hear us? I think Mr. Ashik left the session, um, but we will surely try to get back to you with the answer. Um, before we invite uh, Barrister Manzur Hassan for his closing remarks, can I request Dr. Aino Nisha to share any final comment on way forward? Nisha, sir? Um, no, I heard the observations of um, uh, Mr. Um, Rohan D. Souza. Uh, point is, the governments work in a style and they, they, are, they are not being controlled by engineers, but it is a hobby horse of uh, many professionals to accuse engineers for the, the final decision. What is engineering and what they do? They are given a terms of reference and they are, giving an objective, they are given an objective function by the policymakers, the politicians and the bureaucrats and others, and then they implement it. I will give one example. In 1991, when a five-year plan was being uh, developed for Bangladesh, Water Board or the water sector had a long list of projects. I was an academic at that time. And the government appointed a committee, four or five of us, to rank them which project they should take and which project they should not take, or they, they should take. And there was a project on a dam on um, Matamuhuri River, near Dohajari, and that came out as from economic consideration as the best, the highest uh, uh, benefit cost ratio and internal rate of return and other thing. But from environmental consideration to me, that was a suicidal case because after Kaptai Dam, when the Chakma communities was displaced with Dohajari Dam, the Marma communities would be displaced and 80% of their entire population. And I had to fight with my colleagues of engineering and convince them to put a comment that this project, though appears to be economically the best project, should not be taken up. And starting from 1964, when this project was conceived, it was the top project of the, of the, of the water engineers. But it was withdrawn, taken off from the list in 1992 and the present generation um, Anhara, your generation never heard of that project, which was the most, you know, prized project in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So there are ways to do it. And I would request the listeners, if anyone is interested, how to move forward is to go through the 
the report of the World Commission on Dam, which was published in 2000. And since then, a lot of work has been done. So in 2021, the findings of 2000 is still valid. There are seven guidelines given in that report, how to do a, or what are the, uh, how not to do a high dam project and how to do a high dam project. And um, there, 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 there are then I think um, 10, 15 factors which must be considered. So if those factors finalized in the year again, 2000, which was um, done by World Bank and UN together, IUCN was a secretariat. And subsequently, as I said, I, I read some report like one done by uh, Ajay Dixit and others are excellent. I mean, you have to do something. You cannot, you, you, can, you, you have to manage the revo rivers but it should be managed in a sustainable manner. That is what I'm saying. And this is an interdisciplinary subject. The engineers spend money, other disciplines do not have the money, and that should not be the reason for accusing the engineers for doing something wrong. It should be done collectively based on the guidelines of modern high dams, how to build them are available in literature. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. Um, as we are moving towards the end of the session, I would like to request Barrister Manzoor Hassan OBE to give his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it will be totally inappropriate for, for me to give a summary of this amazing discussion that has happened. And I must say my senior colleague, former Vice Chancellor of BRAC University, Dr. Ainu Nishad, has, has really done that job for me and, 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 and really summed up all the various points that have been touched by our speakers. So really what is left for me to do is to thank all of you for taking part in this discussion. I'm sure we could have continued for, for a couple of more hours, if not more with this discussion. But, um, but I, I think that uh, you know, certainly someone like me, who is now living close to a big river, I have kind of got a very different sort of perspective and certainly be getting in touch with some of you to find out more. But let me conclude by thanking uh, the speakers, uh, the, the, the organizers, and we wish you all the best and look forward to uh, further discussion on this very important uh, topic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, thank you all for joining day two of the Sixth International Water Conference 2021. On behalf of Action in Bangladesh, I would like to thank all the guest speakers and participants who has joined us at the conference. Please be informed that tomorrow is our last day of the conference and we will have um, three sessions. Uh, the first session will be on water, climate, grassroots innovation and solution. The second session will be a special session on photography by renowned photographer Mahmoud Rahman Mahmoud and followed by a closing ceremony. With that, I would like to thank you all for joining us. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>